how are we discovering antibiotics in the 21st century? Antibiotics change the face of medicine and and how why is it so difficult now to find antibiotics and why are we having this crisis? Welcome to Editors in Conversation. This episode is brought to you by antimicrobial agents and chemotherapy, available at aac.aesm.org. I am your host, AAC Editor-in-Chief of uh, Antimicrobial Agents in Chemotherapy, and the podcast is supported by the American uh, um, Society for Microbiology, which publishes AAC. Don't forget to check the October uh, issue of AAC with phenomenal and really outstanding uh, papers. For example, a paper on editor speak of caspofungin effects on the VRE cell envelope, and challenging clinical case of Staphylococcus argenteus treated with daptomycin, and the and new developments in in vitro susceptibility for uh, treponema pallidum uh, to doxycycline, and much more interesting papers. You can find this issue, this issue at aac.asm.org and Editors in Conversation is available in all uh, major podcast outlets. So to discuss uh, the issue of antibiotics, we have really two leaders in the field that are kind enough to, to join. Um, Dr. Jerry Wright, who is the director of the Michael DeGroote Institute for Infectious Diseases and professor in the Department of Biochemistry and Biomedical Sciences, McMaster University in Hamilton, Canada. And the Dr. David Andes, who is the William Craig Professor in the Department of Medicine and Medical Microbiology and Immunology, and head of the, infect of the Division of Infectious Diseases at the University of Wisconsin. And David is also editor of AAC. Welcome, gentlemen, and thank you for joining Editors in Conversation. Oh, it's my pleasure. So uh, we, uh, we have some era in the 20th century where antibiotics changed the face of medicine. And um, then we became, you know, bombarded by antimicrobial resistant organism and the rise of antimicrobial resistant organism. And the antibiotic pipeline is started to dwindling down and basically to face uh, patients where we currently sometimes do not, do not have good uh, options for therapies. So, Jerry. Why don't you give us a overview of how this process of antibacterial discovery, uh, the golden era, and how this became uh, really like a desert now on discovering new molecules? Yeah, sure. I'd be happy to I'll give you my version of, uh, of that history. Um, so the golden era is roughly between 1940 and 1970 when almost all of the uh, current classes of antibiotics, chemical classes uh, were discovered. Um, for the most part, with a couple of exceptions, these are natural products produced by microbes. So penicillin, tetracycline, uh, aminoglycosides, for example. Um, so there was a bit of a gold rush uh, in, in that period of time, a couple of, of decades, lots of drug companies involved, lots of small drug companies involved. They were all small back then. Um, and then there's a good argument to be made that, in fact, the antibiotics built the modern pharmaceutical industry um, from those from those um, those beginnings. Um, the history after that was largely, but not exclusively, the reinvention of a lot of those uh, chemical scaffolds. You know, were multiple generations of cephalosporins now, multiple generations of tetracyclines. And, and um, as you know, the microbes that were originally the source of these, of these compounds did not make them to be drugs. They made them for whatever the reason that they make them for, perhaps to, uh, to fight off their enemies, but they're not drugs. Um, and so we used a lot of natural products as drugs, and but we continued to improve on them. The medicinal chemists got involved, and you could improve pharmacological profiles. You could, as resistance started to emerge in the clinic, you could tinker with the structure and avoid resistance. And there was this sort of to and fro, this sort of war, uh, uh, you know, like a tennis match between the the bugs and the and the drug developers, uh, with very few new scaffolds being discovered. Um, not for, not for lack of trying, there's lots and lots and lots of literature of antibiotic molecules out there, um, but making them into drugs is really, really hard. Part of it is, of course, the older drugs are really good drugs, 
Um, and, and finding an improvement on that has been challenging. Um, so in the mid sort of 1980s, early 1990s, there was a pivot away from natural products to in the, in the pharmaceutical sector in general towards synth small synthetic uh, compounds that could be combinatorialized. And so you could have libraries of millions and millions of compounds, high throughput technologies, structure based drug design where you're losing individual proteins and you're trying to go after them. That worked really well for a lot of areas of human medicine and it worked absolutely terribly for antibiotics. Um, where you know the old approach of screening for cell death was much more effective at the end of the at the end of the day rather than this, and so you had this this really just you know uh, a significant um, scientific challenge. How do you find compounds that are going to be good antibiotics? And while that's happening, the economic models for funding antibiotics started to completely unravel. Um, most of the old antibiotics were off patent, so they were actually quite good, and there's, they remain for you know in a lot of cases very useful, um, making it really making the expected pay point really really low for antibiotics, and um, and, the, and like I said, this is conf so you've got a declining economic opportunity, and a in a declining sort of chemical diversity payout. Uh, biochemistry payout and those things are all going in the wrong direction while resistance is going in 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 this direction and so we ended up in this situation where the large pharmaceutical industry you know over the last 20 years has just looked around and said I can can't make any money if that science is really really hard all the things that we've deployed that have been so successful in heart disease and cancer and everything don't work for antibiotics that's all the sunk infrastructure. Um, we don't know what to do, um, and we're not going to make any money. So it's time to time to get out. And so it really became the realm of smaller companies or spinouts, like in Tasis, for example, of a large pharmaceutical company, AstraZeneca. Um, and in now, as I'm sure most of us are aware, if we're watching this podcast, is that you have this situation where even those small companies when they are successful and they bring a drug to market that that people have asked for have gone bankrupt <laughs> and so again it's the economic challenges confounded with these really difficult scientific ones if it was easy to make antibiotics we would do it we'd find a way to pay for it it's really really hard and you can't make a lot of money so we are this is where we're at yeah, thank thank you, Jerry, for that. Uh, we actually had a podcast about the financial model last time, um, and, and David, following uh, Jerry's comments, so what are you know if it's so difficult to discover antibiotic, what are the approaches that people are currently um, taking to to try to get to that point, including some really cool innovation out there in the field? Can you describe something, including your own, you know, since you are basically both antibiotic hunters at this moment? Well, you know, despite the fact that, as Jerry mentioned, um, there haven't been any new novel mechanism of action antimicrobials come to the market. Uh, what the last one was discovered in the late 1970s. Um, it's not, be you know, there's been a lot of innovation um, uh, in the field. Um, including uh, coming back um, to natural products. As Jerry mentioned, that, that, that's, that's where most of our antibiotics have come from. Uh, those you know, natural product scaffolds are responsible for, I think, 80% or more of the antibiotics we have on the market. And uh, Jerry and others have, have Harvard, tell us that you know, we've really looked uh, it, only a, a minuscule amount uh, of the microbes that are out there for antibiotic production. We know this uh, from phylogenetics, and we know that uh, there's a, the prediction uh, from genetics that there's a lot of diversity out there. Uh, and so people are trying to um, identify new microbes, uh, uh, 
coax or heterologously express um, the genes that are predicted to make these novel antibiotics. Uh, they're trying to grow otherwise uh, uh, microbes that don't grow under laboratory conditions and thus can't make the antibiotics that they're predicted to make. Um, and they're looking in novel places. Um, the group that I'm fortunate enough to collaborate um, is, is, uh, is trying to look in a novel uh, place, specifically um, looking for microbes and antibiotics from those microbes that have been evolutionarily selected um, to live and associate um, with animals. Uh, in this case, um, initially specifically with insects, uh, Cameron Curry's group along with John Clardy found that ants um, had evolved with bacteria um, to produce anti-infectives um, to, pr to protect that environment um, from a fungus pathogen. Uh, and, and that group has gone on to show that that's not unique to ants and, and in fact is common. Uh, those, those symbiotic antibiotic producing bacteria are common across most insects and now we're finding other animals like marine animals as well. And, and by allowing uh, the animals, in this case, an insect, a marine animal, um, to do the bioprospecting, um, the, the prediction is that you'll find um, novel chemistry, novel chemistry with a high likelihood of, of biological um, activity and, and also safety because you're, you're, you know, you're producing, the microbe is producing these in the presence uh, of an animal. And so far, um, you know, we're finding a lot of diversity uh, in these environments and a lot of biological activity uh, and safety in these environments, unlike the end of the traditional bioprospecting, I guess, what was it, the lipopeptides, maybe daptomycin, one of your favorite antibiotics, <laughs> Cesar. Uh, what I, I, I've talked to some folks at Lilly that said they had to screen like a million microbes to find that one uh, novel antibiotic because of this uh, uh, rediscovery um, that, that Jerry mentioned. So I think approaches to dereplicate or find that needle in the haystack um, are promising. So Jerry, you, you've looked at bugs in, in very odd places, including the permafrost in Canada, right? So the genes. Um, so where are other places that we should be looking at to hunt antibiotics? Well, I don't, if I knew that, <laughs> I'd have a solution. I think we should be looking everywhere. I love what David said. I think what we need to do is think about bacteria and their ecological niches and start to start to weave those things together. And, and, and maybe that'll help us, you know, the ant experiments that uh, or discoveries that Cameron Curie has made uh, with David is, is really quite impressive. Um, so, and, you know, the marine uh, bacteria that folks um, like Paul Jensen are, are, are going after, again, it's very unique environments that we haven't sampled a lot. But I do think that there's a even, so you look at it, most of these, these organisms that, or most of the antibiotics come from a class of antibiotics called actinobacteria. And um, those actinos have genomes of somewhere between eight and 12 megabases. And typically they produce 20 to 40 different natural product like molecules, some of which are antibiotics. The problem has been is that when we just use the, the sort of cell death phenotype, basically it was invented by Selman Waxman, it's called a Waxman platform. Um, we tend, as David said, we tend to find the same old things. You know, we find the, the antibiotics that we found in the golden era because those were the easy ones, the to find tetracycline, streptomycin, streptothricin is everywhere. And then as, as David pointed out, you see, in order to find more and more mo uh, novel molecules, you have to screen more and more. The another way to look to do it though, is to use some of the technologies that David was alluding to, and that is just don't use that screen. Um, so look to the genomes now that we can sequence genomes so much easier and look for novel, uh, predicted chemicals, some of those might be antibiotics, some of them might be anti-cancers, who, who knows? Um, so as a way to, to do this, um, another thing that we did uh, reported on a, about a year ago 
is that we re we're using CRISPR to go back to these old collections and if you f and and knock out the ability to make streptomycin. So you get rid of it. So it's streptomycin production using CRISPR, and then you re-screen it to, to see if it makes anything else that might be cool. And that's actually very doable. And you do find interesting new molecules that way. So I could imagine having a series of CRISPR probes to get rid of tetracycline and, and streptomycin and streptothricin, for example, in you know Lily's old collection of whatever that is, a couple hundred thousand strains, I guess, collected over decades, and then reinterrogate them using these kinds of methods. So, you know, the ironic thing, you know, says out of, about all of this is that while antibiotic discovery is on the wane and while um, the need is on the rise and everything, the technology that we have available to us today is so incredibly exciting and so powerful that there's, you know, we're just bound to be successful um, over the over the long run. It's a question is in, in the short term, what are we going to do, which is challenging because, you know, you find a molecule and it takes, you know, a decade or so to get it to, to the market. And of course, at the end of the day, there is no market, then there is no pull to pull that through. Uh, anyways, it just becomes a nice paper and, and then we forget about it. Um, but I think that there's just, there really is lots of different ways to either go to some of these historic collections and reinterrogate them using different assays or, 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 or using sort of genome based approaches or, um, you know, the, the world is a very, very big place with a lot of very interesting ecological uh, niches that I think deserve to be explored a little bit more with some respect on from, you know, of, for the microbiology that li that's inherent there. Absolutely. Uh, David, uh, if antibacterials are challenging to find, the pipeline for antifungals, uh, something that you've been worked on for a long time, is probably smaller. So what do you do to discover new antifungals? Well, I mean, you're right. I mean, it's there There have been very, very few antifungal drug classes uh, that have come to market. In fact, uh, only three, and there are a number of reasons for this, not the least of which um, when you're looking for a drug to kill a fungus, it's hard to not kill mammals as well. So it's, it's hard to find a, a drug that, that targets something specific to the, to the fungus. And so that has certainly um, uh, been challenging, but I do, it's, it's an exciting time uh, in the antifungal field. In fact, there are um, two new classes of of antifungal um, that are in uh, clinical development right now. And um, for reasons that we can only speculate, um, we're finding a lot of uh, antifungals um, in these insect and marine animal, uh, especially in the insect uh, environments, um, perhaps because of fungal pathogens uh, of, of relevance in these symbiotic um, relationships. In fact, um, we've collected over uh, 10,000 different insect species, uh, and you can start to see some of some of these environments are richer for antifungals than than others. So, for example, if you can compare across insects, um, we're we're much more likely to find an antifungal from a cockroach or termite uh, environment than we are from butterflies or crickets. Whereas we're much more likely to find a gram negative agent from crickets and grasshoppers for reasons, again, that, that aren't entirely clear. So, um, yeah, I think we're, we're excited about, we're finding antifungals more than we're finding um, novel antibacterials for sure um, in, in these environments. That's uh, fascinating. Uh, I kind of imagine the lab with all these insects. <laughs> uh, Jerry, um, People tend to think that uh, the the one bullet kills everything is what antibiotics should be, um, and that concept has been revamped a lot, particularly when we have now technologies to be much more precise and and try to 
kill what we don't want to kill and be more precise. You, you, you've uh, uh, published uh, several uh, concepts about, for example, adjuvants. So to add something to a, a known antibiotic to help the antibiotic uh, activity. Um, so what, what strategies are now putting out there instead of the early one bullet uh, kill everything? And, and, and would that work when you try to do sort of precision antibiotic medicine with uh, when molecule killing one bug that you will specifically target? Yeah, so that's a great question. And it's, it's I mean, that's the fantasy, right? That you could really have some strategy, whether it's a very, it's a single compound that has a very narrow spectrum or a combination that enhances um, activity towards a, uh, a certain um, genus or even a species. And it's definitely doable in the lab. Um, and so we've done um, some studies in this. We're not the obviously the only ones at all working in this area, nor did we, did we were we the first to do so. The people have, have been combining things together for a long time. Um, but uh, one of the biggest challenges, and I'm, and I'm sure as both you and David know as, as practitioners of of infectious disease medicine is that you don't know what the organism is. And so we can develop these tools and I think it's it's reasonable to do so. And there's compounds that uh, people are bringing to market that are you know very narrow towards acinetobacter, for example. Um, but the, the, the thing that has to come with it is some kind of, fa some kind of either a diagnostic or a, a strategy that would give you guys um, sufficient amount of, of, of uh, comfort that you're trying to go after a single organism. But the, not to bring the economics part of it back, but you can imagine that this, such compounds in and of them or such regimens would be even more economically disadvantaged because then you're looking at a very small subset of infections. Um, so, but if we take that off the table and find and say we'll find a way to pay for it, we do it at cancer, we do it in other areas. Why can't we do it in infectious disease? Then I think that there is a lot of opportunity to do so. And in fact, if you go back to some of you know, there's 60 years about of the Journal of Antibiotics, and someone did a calculation that says we're you know there's been roughly 30,000 compounds that have been discovered in those. A lot of those have what we're called very narrow spectrum, and so. At the time, and let's say 1970, it's not a good candidate. You know, we'll write a paper about it, but it's not a good candidate because they're we're looking for things that kill everything or kill most things. Um, so the business model changes, right? As as medicine gets better, and so we've the diagnostics has lagged in this field because the antibiotics have been so good <laughs> and so safe, right? So ah, I'm not really sure what it is, but I'll give you, you know a gram of, of, or two grams of penicillin because it'll get most things, right? Um, where you wouldn't even dream of doing that in an, a lot of other um, therapeutic areas. So there was really no need for, for developing really careful diagnostics. But I will say, you know, people forget that there are, there are existing regimens that are very organism specific. You know, TB is a good example. There's a lot of drugs out there that we use for TB that are only used for TB. Um, I guess you could also argue at the same time that there's a, there, you know, it proves it that there's no economic model for narrow spectrum drugs. <laughs> um, Absolutely. So David, any comment on this? No, I mean, I would agree. I, you know, it's, it's going to be challenging and, you know, I, it'll, it'll be interesting to see how it plays out with some of the, newer strategies that are in fact targeting um, single species like monoclonal antibodies and phage therapy and things like that. I mean, um, you know, we're going to have to overcome these hurdles, financial and diagnostic hurdles, I think, uh, to get there, but it's, it's going to be a tall order. So um, just following up on that, David, um, so, for example, the, the, the combination of molecules that potentially have a target in bacteria and another molecule that can either 
modulate virulence property, modulate the immune system, or as a phage to you know kill more bacteria. Um, how do you see that evolving? And and um, th there are several people who work in the research and development in pharmaceutical companies who think that that might be very very difficult to prove. Uh, that they actually work and is worth spending money. So what is your take on this? Well, I think it's fascinating and I think it's a, it's an area that we've not tapped into, at least in, in anything that's that's um, to come to the market. So these antivirulence properties, um, uh, there are a number of issues I think that we're gonna have to be able to get our heads around. One is it's challenging for, for some of these agents that have unique mechanisms to have an in vitro measure of potency that we're used to having with antibiotics in the, in the MIC. Um, second is if you're, if you're an antivirulence property and you're not necessarily immediately killing the bacteria as a result of your mechanism of act activity, how do you design preclinical and, cl and clinical studies to measure that? And lastly, you know, when you, when you move into clinical trials, if you think about it, you know, we're used to designs um, that are, are based upon non-inferiority. So you have to be just as good as your comparator. But in this case, you're going to have to design studies because you're already, if you're using it with something that's already established, you're going to have to be designing studies for superiority. And so the expense of studying these antivirulence uh, agents is gonna probably be more than we're used to spending on traditional antibiotic clinical development. It's already hugely, hugely expensive. I think I saw, um, I think it was the Kagen said that for one of their trials, it cost them about a, a million dollars per patient, per valuable patient for, for, for plazomycin. So I, it's the science is amazing, and I hope we're able to overcome some of these hurdles. But we're going to have to get clever, I think, in the development on the development side to for some of these to come to fruition. I'm interested to hear what Jerry has to say about that. Yeah, me too. <laughs> <laughs> I totally agree. I think I think this science requires the clinical trial science to catch up to it. Right. And this is an issue. And, and I don't know how that's that's done. I mean, you know, we're evaluating drugs now the way we did in the 1950s for the most part. Um, and it's really just, you know, are you better or are, are you not dead? <laughs> is enough of you not dead compared to the other people? Um, and I think that there's room there to to think about this in a bit more of a of a of a different way. I don't know what it is, to be honest, but it seems to me that 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 if I was casting my, you know, my crystal ball ahead 50 years, you know, what was this, this look like? Here's what we know is that the current strategy of just trying to find antibiotics the way they are and not trying not, and not pushing those, those new areas, um, is failed. It's failed dramatically. And the net result is that people are going to die that otherwise wouldn't have because resistance is going in one direction. And, um, we're seeing all sorts of new infectious agents. We're living in the middle of a pandemic right now. Um, these things are going to continue to happen. Think Candida auris appeared out of nowhere, you know, a decade ago. Um, we can predict, you know, we're all three of us, I'm sure we're absolutely play, put money down that there'll be new pathogens coming forward. Um, if we only tackle them in the same old way that we've done in the past, then I think we're not going to be very successful. I'm not smart enough to tell you how to fix it. But I think that we really have to, we have to incentivize, there's two things I think we really need to do. One is that we really have to incentivize young people, the smartest young people coming out of our, all of our labs to have a, a career in this, this field, so that we really attract the absolute smartest people, period. Like the, like the, you know, the cancer field did in the seventies and eighties and nineties, right? It was, that's where all the money is. And so if you want to start a, you know, if you have ambitions to have a great career, there's a way more money in those areas than there is in 
in antibiotics because antibiotics were working so well, <laughs> right? It was at the margins. There was stuff to do, of course. It's not to denigrate what was going on, but it just means that 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 it's the the hill was steeper to get to climb. Um, and I also think we need to think really broadly outside the box, which is I, I hate using that term, but really thinking differently about how do we um, how do we do trials? How do we um, how do we do crazy things like uh, virulence? Um, how do we do phage that's not just a one-off for some particular very, very sick patient? I think all of these things are tremendously exciting, um, taking full advantage of the technological advantages, uh, advances that we've made over the decades, applying it to a field that I think really has a clinical need to it. We just have to figure out how to do it in a way that is commensurate with the 21st century need. And that's going to require some really smart people. Absolutely. And we're trying to encourage that at this point. Let's talk about resistance, you know, because unlike other drugs in medicine, we, even, even with the smartest people finding great drugs, uh, the bugs are going to find the way, right? And then going back to your story, Jerry, about understanding you know, how bacteria have resistant genes, you know, as part of their evolution on this earth, um, you think they are going to respond and it's several strategies to overcome and not, not that great. So, um, so how, how do you, and I start with David, how do you envisage um, resistance as a big challenge, as a big factor for these molecules to be effective. How, how would you tackle them? Should be a, a, a some sort of measurements, both, for example, on resistant development and effect on the microbiome that should be tailored to every single molecule that we discover moving forward? Well, I think definitely. I mean, I think resistance is really the reason that we're we're still in the game, right? I mean, we're, you know, I think this, it's it's inspiring us to, to find new molecules. Um, but, you know, antibiotics are, are unique as a pharmacologic agent is the, in that resistance is, is you know, losing effectiveness is, is the rule. Uh, and um, and some, some drugs, some targets, uh, uh, this is uh, likely to happen faster than uh, than uh, than later, and so I agree with you, Cesar, that that uh, understanding how fast this is going to happen um, is critical, and and then designing strategies uh, to try and slow um, that from happening. Um, and, and I think you know, amazing work from Jerry and others looking at combinatorial approaches antivirulent strategies to um, slow, I won't use the word prevent, um, but slow uh, the development of resistance, I, I think is key. So, so innovative approaches in that regard um, are, are super important. Jerry? Yeah, I think, um, so yeah, it's a, it's a subject that's near and dear to my heart. Um, one of the things that, that I find interesting to think about in this area um, is that, you know, we and others have done ex some experiments that, sh that show without difficulty that antibiotics have been around probably for as long as bacteria have. So billions of years. Um, and they've accrued. So when you go to the environment, environmental bacteria are really drug resistant. They're, they're not terribly infectious unless you're immune compromised, but they're really drug resistant. That's a, that's a, an echo of this, this natural history of resistant of antibiotic production and resistance. Um, the thing I find really interesting, two things. One is that the bacteria that normally that we cause think of as pathogens, other than things that are opportunistic pathogens that come from the environment, say like acinetobacter or pseudomonas, staph, strep, um, these kinds of things. They're not terribly drug resistant, except they are now, but they weren't. <laughs> um, so that's really interesting. So that means that there is, there are ways to select for lack of resistance. Um, and 
the organisms that live out in the environment, out in the, looking out in my lawn over here, um, they're really drug resistant, but they're not resistant to everything. So there is some kind of un, untapped sort of um, science that we haven't don't have or have things figured out yet because it's you know antibiotics still work, right? There's there's there are strains as we all know that are really drug resistant, but they there's a lot of antibiotics that still work just tickety boo. Um, it's you know especially in the community, and so there I think it's what the lesson is that stewardship has become the you know has been that this amplification of resistance is a failure of stewardship, where we we haven't appreciated how quickly resistance can can accrue and and i think that there might be strategies if we start thinking about how does how do environmental uh ecosystems manage resistance um and is that a way that we can start to think about how we're using antibiotics appropriately in addition to obviously we're going to have to find new ones so there's no question we're going to have to find new strategies new antibiotics new ways of doing things um but you know can we start thinking really about the ecosystem the uh, inside a hospital and ways to we can we can decrease the opportunity for resistance to to emerge and to this to be disseminated in some cases it's too late you know the barn door is open and the the plasmids are out there and they're you're not going to lose genes um but there are some clever ideas, some, you know, at least in the lab, some gene drive ideas that you could actually start to eradicate resistance genes. And I could imagine in a in an environment that is tightly controlled, say a long-term care care facility or something that's being ravaged with something, then you could have, you could unleash some some 21st century uh, strategies to overcome resistance by tackling resistance genes themselves. So but that's, it's kind of science fiction right now, but I think it's doable. So, uh, David, uh, how about the microbiome, right? You know, since that's mostly our reservoir of resistant genes. And there is a lot of um, thinking about manipulating the microbiome to help overcome resistance. So um, how fast and how far are we from really getting there? Well, I mean, I, I think, you know, the microbiome is, is just like these environments where where was that, that Jerry's talking about? I mean, I think it's clear that our that our microbiome produces chemicals. Um, it's it's their currency uh, to interact with each other, um, and I think they probably are producing. We know some of the microbiome at least. Uh, there has been some drug discovery. I think lantibiotics, for example. So I think it's it's understanding uh, which components of the microbiome, especially when. Um, um, when placed together, um, uh, prevent resistance. So I think that's a that's a real fertile uh, field. And in fact, you know, and when when Jerry was talking about sort of targeting resistance genes and things like that, one of the things I was thinking back to your earlier comments is, you know, these organisms produce what maybe 40, 50 different antibiotics at once. So in fact, they're you know they're using combination therapy in nature perhaps to prevent resistance. And so I think understanding that in our discovery process and, and especially in the microbiome, uh, you know, maybe a strategy to reduce the likelihood of resistance development. Jerry, any comment on the microbiome manipulation? Yeah, I think I, I would agree with that. I think that there's opportunities to do that. I mean, there's, you know, we've seen that fecal transplant, for example, can be used to get rid of, um, uh, you know, difficult or, or, or embedded species that are challenging uh, to deal with. So C. diff is one, but I'm sure that it it'll work with, you know, recalcitrant, difficult to eradicate multi-drug resistant organisms. The, um, the key for them, the, for me, the microbiome is, is there's a tremendous opportunity to, to avoid the op, the, you know, a lot of bad outcomes of antibiotics because antibiotics, the ones that we have traditionally used are indiscriminate, right? And so you'd want to be able to to target things. And and one of the lessons from, as, as David was pointing out from the microbiome is that there are, there's, they're in the process of like, this is, these ecosystems are 
in um, are in uh, constant um, interactions with each other, and they control this through chemical signals, including antibiotic-like molecules. Antibiotics is one of them, but my, um, uh, bacteriosins and other things that are that are there to keep the ecosystem stable. Sort of gets back to what I was saying about how do we how does resistance not just get you know how is it are how is it that we only have don't have just one microorganism out there that produces everything and is just the super super bug of all super bugs and it's because ecosystems are complicated and and I think that's there's so much exciting science in there just some discovery science how do these ecosystems how are they stabilized how do they deal with flux in, in the case of the intestinal microbiome there's lots of flux is happening you know on a daily basis they get you know depending on what you've had for breakfast that morning so how these things how these uh, ecosystems stabilize using these chemicals and what can we learn from that to try and and, and build in maybe not the next generation of antibiotics but the generation after that right because i think it's a little it, it might be a bit too challenging there's so much basic science that has to be done in this field yet but it's it's so exciting and it's moving so fast i'll probably be wrong i'd be happy to be wrong <laughs> it's fascinating just to to conclude david um the final thoughts about the the pharmacological parameters when you have new molecules particular that are non-traditional antibiotics uh, our audience is, uh, is is we have a big audience on the in the pharmacology part so how, how do you deal with the pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics of non-traditional antibiotics and, and, and how do you put that forward? I think if you step back and, and you, you know, despite realizing we might not have an MIC, we might have difficulty in um, measuring the concentration of some of these, these molecules, I think stepping back and just looking for exposure response. So the concentration of something relative to, to some biologically um, important endpoint. And, you know, I think, you know, where, you know, what we need to do with these really unique mechanism of action, especially these antivirulence molecules, um, is to really think about, think outside the box on, on how how we're going to measure effect. So I think the rest of it is, is really no different. It's exposure and response, but it's coming up with these novel approaches to measure effectiveness um, and then translating this preclinical effectiveness to something that's going to happen in patients is going to be the key to designing clinical trials um, to move these agents forward. Thank you very much. This has been a fascinating conversation. This is Editors in Conversation. This is Cesar Arias, Editor-in-Chief, signing off. Thank you very much.